Welcome to worship with the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church. We're so glad you're here with us this morning or any time of day you may be worshiping with us online. As we gather for worship this morning, please join me. If you have a bulletin printed out from your email, you can join together in our in unison portions of worship. If moving forward you'd like to participate in our liturgy, let our church office know and we'll send you a copy of the bulletin ahead of time. Jesus said, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. We do love the Lord, and we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Let us, as the family of God, worship together. I invite you to join me as we pray together our prayer confession in unison, followed by a brief silence for your personal prayers of confession. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to love one another, to follow in the way of his commandments, and to share his risen life. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise, that amid all the changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joy is found. Hear us now as we humble ourselves before you. Christ showed his love for us on the cross, and he is now risen and glorified so that you and I may enter into salvation with him. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Hear these words of comfort found in Psalm 31. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me, since you are my rock and my fortress. For the sake of your name, leave and guide me. Free me from the traps set before me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit, Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. Oh. Today's affirmation of faith will be an excerpt from the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
hopefully the words of this familiar hymn were very comforting to you. As we turn to scripture this morning, please join me in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you that in the beginning of scripture you declare that creation is good. In fact, you say it's very good. As we approach scripture now to hear about goodness and how we can live into the goodness we are called to live, we ask that your Holy Spirit be present and guide us in the hearing and proclamation of this word and in the living out of this word as we go about our daily lives. We ask this all giving thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I invite you to turn with me to 1 Peter. We're continuing right after where we read last Sunday together. Now we're in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning with the first verse. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now the entirety of this book of First Peter is a letter encouraging those who read it to live a life of holiness. And now that holiness is being described as the goodness that each Christian lives out in Christian community. Many of us have noticed, probably many times in our lives, that as you live out your Christian faith, others notice that you are different. That you don't maybe behave or speak or respond in the same way that others do to the same situation. Maybe it's how you control your anger. Maybe it's the fact that you choose not to use vulgar language. Maybe it's the fact that you respond with, can I pray for you when you are concerned about someone? Maybe it's seeing acts of benevolence and giving, or even seeing you do simple things like show common courtesy. Others have probably noticed many times that you behave in a way that the world would declare as good. That as being a follower of Christ, as we live in the word, and attempt to be disciples, to be more Christ-like, it becomes our primary nature to act in ways that the world, whether they be Christian or non-Christian, that the world looks at and says, well, that was good behavior, a good response. That was a good thing that you did or said. Or it was good that you kept your mouth shut in that situation. This goodness is an aspect of our striving for holiness. And first Peter writes this letter in an effort to ensure that people have this awareness 
that they are truly Christian. The question comes up often, how do I know I'm saved? How do I know I'm part of Christ's family? How do I know I'm one of these chosen or elect? How do I know that, yes, I've truly received the free gift of God's grace? And this letter is written to reassure Christians that if you discover yourself doing good things, saying good things, if your first inclination is to be helpful, respectful, courteous, kind, to show mercy and favor, and others are noticing that, other people are saying to you, wow, that was a really nice thing you did, or, or how humble of you, or how generous, or you put others first, or you're so patient or kind, you're a good listener, you're a good friend, you are reassuring in my life. You are comforting in my life. You are an amazing person. I want to be more like you. If people are saying these kinds of things about you, the author of 1 Peter wants you to know that's an affirmation. That's the Holy Spirit affirming that truth in you that yes, you are acting in a Christ-like manner. You are acting as a disciple of Jesus. You are living out your faith. And the author points out that Jesus himself who acted with goodness and mercy in every action of his entirety of his earthly life. He was often praised for it, but he was often ridiculed, run out of town, and attacked for it as well. So even if you do something good, even if you act in a way that shows God's holiness, goodness, and mercy, it may not be received well by others. In fact, they may think you are strange. That you, like Christ, have chosen to respond to someone who's angry by showing mercy. Or to someone who is vengeful by asking them to slow down and seek justice. Or when you see someone hurt, instead of running away, you run to help. When you see someone in need, you offer to pray for them and sit with them and listen while others may be too busy and just rush on with their lives. This behavior sometimes is affirmed. People say, wow, you're amazing. But other times people look at you and say, that was odd. The way you are behaving isn't really what I thought the first reaction would have been. You know, that person is, is a gossip, or that person's mean, or that, that person is, is not pleasant to be with, and you chose to show them kindness that is an unconventional response. And as people notice that what you're doing is unexpected, it's not kindness and goodness just to people who are kind and good to you. It's not mercy just to people who show you mercy. It's not love just to people who love you. It's goodness, kindness, love, patience, understanding, the gift of listening offered to all people, even if they're being jerks. Even if they are having a bad day and said awful things to you, even if they made a promise and they broke it, and it's the hundredth time they've broken a promise to you, you respond in a Christ-like way. You respond in a way that shows the goodness and mercy of God. You don't let people walk all over you. You don't become a pushover. You respond in ways that are just and right, ways that are fair, ways that are honest, but ways that show goodness. And people notice. First Peter refers to us as disciples as being the living stones that are piled upon the foundation of Christ. Christ is the capstone, that cornerstone, the place we built the building from. This is where we started. And then we pound, put uh, stone upon stone upon stone on top to build this huge temple to God. And you and I and everyone who follows Christ, we are those living stones. So what we've built is a temple to God, a living temple to God. And all of the building blocks are all of the faithful. So when we go out into the world, we're practicing this goodness, this mercy, these acts that show forth the love of Christ. We are bringing the temple of God out into the community. We need to be especially reminded of this now when we are not all gathered here in this physical worship space 
in our sanctuary in the Elkins Park Presbyterian Church on Cedar Road. Now we are in our households, some in the zip code, some much farther away. We are isolated physically from one another and from this place. But we are not separate from being that holy temple built of living stones on the foundation of Jesus Christ. No matter where we are, who we are with, how we are interacting, whether it be by phone or email, or being able to talk with the people in our household face to face, whether it be still going out as an essential worker into the workplace with colleagues and customers in the community, or it be at home, we are still those living stones. And scripture says those living stones will build something up that's magnificent, this temple to God. But also for some, those living stones can be a stumbling block, which people fall over. When you act in ways that show goodness, mercy, kindness, that you're striving for holiness, non-Christians will see you do that, and some will respond and go, wow, you were so nice to me. You showed me compassion and caring when you didn't need to. That really meant something to me. Thank you. Tell me why you're like that. And it opens this amazing door to evangelism where you can tell them, well, I'm trying to be like Christ, who is my Lord, who showed kindness and mercy to everyone. I fall short of that high bar he set on holiness, but I do my best to live out the values that Christ has taught because he's loved me and forgiven me and shown me grace even though I don't deserve it as a sinner. And I'm so grateful I'm attempting to live into this life Christ has called me to. Yet you can do the same good action, the same action of kindness or mercy, grace to someone else. And instead of them being thankful and inquisitive and curious, the response could be, wait a second, that's a weird reaction. Why are you being so nice to me? I'm a jerk. Why are you forgiving me? I just broke my hundredth promise to you. Why are you valuing me? You and I, we are enemies, strangers, adversaries. We're from two different teams. Why are you showing me any sort of kindness? Why be good to me? And these individuals, they, like those who've rejected Christ in all of Scripture, they respond with this foreignness of, I don't understand your reaction. That doesn't seem logical or appropriate to the gut wrench reaction of human emotion. I'm uncomfortable that you responded to my poor behavior with kindness, patience, understanding, forgiveness, mercy. The list can go on and on of these good ways that you responded. The scripture speaks of us being aliens, strangers. That we, even our own culture and community, when we act in ways that are obedient to Christ, we can be rejected as being strange because of our behavior. And so we acknowledge we are strangers. In the way that we approach things as followers of Christ compared to those who do not know Christ as Lord, as Lord, that makes us strangers. Things are strange between us. It also makes us aliens. It makes us foreigners. It makes us those who have this great hope in an eternal life in a place beyond this physical earthly realm. Acknowledging that our earthly life is short and temporary and that we're looking forward to our forever home with God. And as we encounter people, live into our Christian life, act as disciples of Jesus, showing this goodness, kindness, and mercy, striving for holiness, we get one of those two responses, the same responses that Christ got. People will follow us, be curious, want to know more, listen about why we act the way we do, and desire to be like us. And in doing so, the Holy Spirit will Come into that relationship, continue to work on their heart, and allow them to trust Christ as their Savior. Yet others will respond to us and think we're off-putting or strange, and will be uncomfortable, and they will reject us the way many people have rejected Christ, as saying, your behavior is not what I expected, and therefore you are so much the other that I can't even pause long enough to process how strange and different you are, or even consider wanting to be like you. And we as Christians live in that in-between place, 
that place of trying to strive to be holy and good in our own lives, while realizing that some people will embrace us and seek in their own way to know and be the way we are in relationship with God, and yet others will find it very unattractive. And we hope and pray that they'll encounter a different Christian in a different time and place and maybe find that individual worth the curiosity and the pursuit of discovering why they behave the way they do. Each one of us cannot evangelize successfully every other non-Christian. It's impossible. This is why it's amazing that the church is made of a diversity of people with a diversity of gifts. Some of you are amazing prayer warriors. Others of you write letters and connect with people in amazing ways. Some of you are great talkers. You can call up people and amazingly share stories with them and laughs and good times. Others of us are wonderful listeners. Some of us are go-getters that are out there helping, running errands, getting everything done. Yet others of us are at home, quiet and reflective, reading scripture, engaging in prayer, and preparing a life of holiness the way we feel called to be led. All of these ways, though, show the goodness of God. And we have to sometimes swallow our pride, acknowledge in humility that some people will be attracted to us and how we express the goodness of God, and other people will just think we are odd and strange, and they can't wrap their heads around why we would say, do, or behave the way we are. And we move on. Just as Jesus told his disciples to knock the sand off their feet and keep on moving, we're called to do the same. So I encourage you, as you attempt to be good, as you pursue the holiness of God, to remember this call, to live in a way that reflects that we are a living temple built on the foundation of Christ, seeking to be good, to encourage others to know the Lord. Amen. Now this morning, as we come to our time of prayer together, I would encourage you to keep praying by name for those first responders and those on the front lines we have on our prayer list. I'm going to lift up their names to you again. So we're continuing to pray for all health care providers, for Nikki and Russell, for Nicole, Carly, Lauren, for Valerie, Vicka, Pat, Dawn, and everyone else who's working in health care right now. We also want to lift up in prayer, of course, our entire community, our neighbors, family, and friends, our church community. As restrictions start to loosen, our prayer continues to be that people stay healthy and well, that we stay safe, and that in the near future we can return to things that are more familiar and return to a new way of life that is better than we could have ever expected. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we are so grateful for your call upon us to live holy lives, to seek that our first response to everyone and everything we encounter would be a response that reflects your goodness, Guide us, Lord, as we encounter those who are curious and excited about our response. Allow your Holy Spirit to give us the words and presence to guide them to you. And Lord, when we feel rejected, when others look at us and maybe even mock us for our faith, guide us to keep moving forward, to keep pressing on living faithful lives, aware that your Holy Spirit in its time and place and with the right individuals will work on each person's heart giving them the opportunity to respond. Lord, we thank you for the words of scripture calling us to lives that truly show your goodness, especially in this time of separation. We ask that you remind us of the powerful, comforting presence of your Holy Spirit. Keep us connected as the body of Christ. Guide us, Lord, to be those living stones in the temple no matter where we may be, offering our lives up in praise of our Lord Jesus, who taught us all to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I thank you for worshiping with us this morning. I invite you to continue worshiping with us every Sunday morning online and engaging in Bible studies with us and other ways to reach out to your church, to your community. And please stay well. Go now with the blessings of God, our creator, Jesus, our Messiah, and the knowledge of the ever-present, ever-comforting Holy Spirit.
Amen.